Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and today I'm really excited to welcome as my guest, Sherry Sokolowski. Sherry, welcome to my show. It's great to be here, Meredith. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm so excited, Sherry. It's not often I have, you know, someone that I've known for more than 10 years now, as I have with you. Uh, Sherry is the owner and event planner at SLS Strategic Event Planning and Consulting. And she's an expert in putting on live events and has been for the last 15 years. And the reason that she and I go back so far is that I was a member of the Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle back, I think I first joined it in 2008. And at Mm. that time, Sherry was not only the executive assistant to Bill Glazer, she was also the event planner. And I went to, very faithfully, every year they put on two big events. I went to both of those events every year for a number of years, and they were all memorable partly because of the excellent job that Sherry did running them. So she really knows what she's doing. And in 2012, she started her own company, which is the one I just introduced, where she is helping uh, speakers, consultants, authors, trainers, and many other small and medium-sized business owners put on live events. And of course, things have changed over the last few months where live events don't mean necessarily in person. And so we're going to be exploring both aspects, both in-person and virtual events. And Sherry is just such an expert in this area with 15 years or more now experience um, under your belt, belt, Sherry. I'm so excited about what you have to share with my listeners. And so I know I gave some background um, Mm -hmm. related to your expertise, but why don't you fill in some of the gaps there that I didn't cover that, um, what about your journey uh, to um, the work that you're doing now with clients? Thank you for that great introduction, Meredith. Yeah, uh, I remember back in the good old days of GKIC, where it was like a family reunion, where we all got together a couple of times Mm -hmm. a year, and it was such a wonderful experience, and I miss those days for sure. Um, Yeah, so so my journey really started with Bill back in 2005, and I want to touch on that because of where it took me when I started my business in 2012 being Bill's executive assistant and event planner allowed me to be in just a a great part of every piece of putting the event together from Mm -hmm. A to Z. You know, being his assistant, I did all of his presentations. I was in on all of his meetings. So his marketing meetings on the strategy behind the funnel and marketing the event and the themes that he and Dan put together and the direct mail pieces and why they did it a certain way Uh, It was a great learning experience, as well as being part of bringing the speakers in and working with Bill on the agenda. And he would explain to me why we mapped out the agenda the way that we did. And when it came time for them to sell a high item from stage, he strategically placed that presentation in the agenda a certain way. And he explained why. And then I got to see it live from stage happen and how successful it was. And why we introduced networking roundtables and how we wanted to logistically place them out and plan them out and also being in on all of his mastermind meetings. So, you know, during those days, we had people like Russell Brunson and Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher and Yannick Silver, part of Bill and Dan's masterminds. And I was a fly on the wall because being his assistant, I had to be there and I would learn and hear what they were doing to build their businesses. And it was funny, Meredith, because in the beginning, I came from the corporate and nonprofit world, not the entrepreneurial world. 
So info marketing and info businesses and super conferences and all that and direct and online marketing was kind of a foreign language to me. I didn't understand it. I'm like, what are they talking about? But slowly over time, it started to click. And I was learning through this process. And I was able to bring that to the table when it came time to start helping my clients out in 2012. And the journey was so fun for me because it allowed me to take the business strategy behind planning and help my clients do the same thing. So it was it was a, a great deal of fun for me. And that showed in the way that you <laughs> showed up um, at those events and just the way they ran. So thank you so much for that. So let's let's start with that one word that you've mentioned a couple of times, and that's strategy or strategic. Yes. Uh, before someone gets into jumping into doing a live event, Talk a little bit about the place that word has in the process. Oh, yes. Thank you. Because that is a very big, important part of the placement. So a lot of the clients that come to me are typically people who haven't done an event yet, or they've done them in the past, and they just weren't as successful as they had hoped they would be. And when we start our conversation, it is all about strategy. And it starts with, because I treat events as another part of your business. It's another way to market your business. So that's why it's a strategy. It's, so you have to strategically plan your events, your live event, whether it's in person or virtual, to tie it to your business. And when we have that conversation, we start with why. Why do you want to have this event? And what do you want that outcome to be? just like a business plan, just like your business goal. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for you to not stop and take that same approach with your event because it's a huge, big, significant part of the success to your business and your brand. So we strategically talk through it. And the other part of it and why it's called a strategy is because you want to take the time to figure out how you best can use that event to strategically grow your business and your brand. And that is, what are the things that you're doing in your business that you can let everyone know about at the event so that they can be a part of it too and say, yes, I want that. And it's tied to your business so that the event isn't just a one and done ticket that a lot of people have used events for. Right? Yeah, I'm going to sign up. I want to register. You teach them the content you, you have and shared with them what you want them to learn. But how does that strategically tie to your business and your brand so that when the event is over, the experience isn't over and it just the enthusiasm and the want for more just grows and grows and grows. So that's where the strategy comes into play, Meredith, because you, you have to take the time to talk that strategy first so that all the effort, the, re the energy and the investment that you put in time and money pays off at the end. That's such a great point, Sherry, because I think sometimes people get caught up in the how to, how can I do this? Right. And, yeah. and, and you help them step back. Your questions were great. The why and the yes. what, so yes. that they're not looking at it in isolation, but in the context of the bigger picture of what they want to have happen afterwards. And you've worked with so many uh, folks with these kinds of events over time. So one of the key things I think that would be helpful for folks that are listening that maybe have not done a live event is mm -hmm. avoiding mistakes that you've seen. So besides someone perhaps not thinking strategically about this, what are some other mistakes that you've seen people make when they're planning again, live events that are either in person or online, what mistakes have they made that we could help our listeners avoid encountering themselves? Oh gosh, where do I start? <laughs> um, the logistics. So logistics is a big word, but when you take a step back and I'm talking about logistically of the behind the scenes, because here's the big mistake that people do is they go to another person's event and they see what everyone else sees and they see how grand it is and the experience and the content and how much they paid for their ticket and trying to multiply it by how many people were in the seats and thinking, oh, I can do that. 
I'm going to walk away and make this kind of money from the event. Well, they don't realize the logistics behind the scenes of what it took to put that event on. So I'll have people call me and say, well, what does my budget look like? What should I plan for? And I'm like, well, that's a big question. I always answer a question with a question. And sometimes it's a little bit frustrating for my clients, but I do it because I need to take them strategically through the path. Mm -hmm. Right. So the mistakes logistically that they forget about are you need audiovisual, which in, we call the terminology AV. And that can be very simple. It could be one screen, two screen, pipe and drape, a, a couple of small lights, videos and, and, and microphones. Or if you really want it to be an extreme experience, you have color lights, you have moving lights, you have multiple screenshots, you have switching back and forth, you have all of this other stuff. But then they forget the real focus of the after. They forget that they need to have a dedicated camera person with someone following that camera person to take testimonials, to take what we call the B-roll sizzle reel footage, because those two particular things will help carry you through in your business marketing for your business, if you do it properly, and your next event. So if you only focus on the here and now of what's happening in the seats with the people watching, then you're forgetting about the after. So it's, it's, everything has multiple things. In other words, AV, it's not just what's happening on stage. It's what else can you do with it after the event? Are you recording it so that you can sell it so that you can create products afterwards so that you can pull it out and make modules for training for your clients that you're selling? I mean, there's so many different things. And the other part of the logistics is the amount of staff. Uh, you know, do you, people think, well, I don't have enough staff. Well, you do need to think thoroughly through what are the things that are going to happen throughout the event and where you need your staff placed for that. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times logistically, people make the mistake of putting their staff in the wrong positions. And why I say that is because your staff is the only one that will know what your business is like other than yourself. You want them in the key roles that are going to connect them to the customers in the room. You want them in the key roles that are going to be connecting them with potential customers in the room. So they should always be the face of that, not the ones behind the registration desk, not the ones greeting them at the door, not the ones passing out the forms. If you've got enough staff to do that, yes, but you don't want a volunteer or a temp or an intern being the ones that are selling or being customer service to your business. So that's where the branding comes into play. So those are the two big logistical things that I think people make the mistake of. And there's a lot of little, as you can understand, pieces in under each one of those that people make the mistake of not thinking thoroughly through. Mm -hmm. Well, let's tap a little deeper into what you were saying about their staff, <clears throat> whether it's you know, full-time employees or a member, or, you know, that's a contract person that works with them. Uh, what are the roles that you would recommend that they zero in? Because as I was listening to you, I thought, well, if that person's at the registration desk, they are the face and they're greeting people, but that's not what you're recommending, it sounds like. I'm not saying don't let that not be part of it but don't, don't let that be the only part of it. Mm -hmm. And here's what I mean by that. So thank you for allowing me to clarify that. So when, yeah. Yeah. No, so go ahead. I want to hear um, how can they, you know, help to either bring in new clients or um, cement or solidify those existing relationships with people that have come because they're already doing business with you. Exactly. And what I mean by that is, is you don't just have one registration table. So back in the old GKIC days, if you remember, we would have a help desk. And the help desk was typically someone that is the one handling a lot of the behind the scenes customer service related questions on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. And we would have someone there. So you need, you need a help desk at an event. And basically that should be your staff that knows your customers well, that knows your systems well, that also has a great personality in dealing with people. They have to be a very good customer oriented person mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times you'll have people go to the help desk that are upset because their name is not listed at the table. 
So if you have someone at that help desk that can't handle that kind of interaction, then it's going to blow up and it's going to be a bad experience for that attendee right off the bat, as well as for the staff. And it's just going to be downhill. So you'll, mm. you always have to make sure that it's that right person. And that's why I say it's always best for it to be someone from your office, because they're going to know your business policy. They're going to know how to interact with your clients. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, an upgraded service, if you will, an upgraded ticket at the event, that's another place where your staff should be. A lot of people refer to it as VIP, and that's typically where your higher end are going to. They got a higher ticket value. They have a higher ticket experience. So you want your staff to be at that registration area because they will most likely know their names or their faces, mm -hmm. and you want that interaction. With your general admission area, that is where you can have temps or volunteers handling with maybe one staff overseeing it. And that other staff could be a floater. So that's typically how I manage the events that I conduct for my clients is I outline it that way. Then when events start is when those other duties come into play. Mm. And you can have one staff person kind of overseeing regist late registrations as they're coming in, but that's not where their full responsibility should be. Or you can shift it to the help desk to where any other and things that are happening throughout the event, forms are being turned in or people want to upgrade or anything like that can be handled at the help desk where you already have a staff person assigned. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that kind of clears up what I was oh, saying. Yeah, that's great. Well, the other thing it does is it helps people understand, you know, putting on an event, like you say, has a lot of logistics behind the scene. And this is where being strategic is so important because there are so many moving parts and having the right people in the right roles is an important aspect of ensuring, you know, that experience really is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, with someone who's just, you know, new to their business or launching a business, um, putting on a live event could be a really kick, a great kickstart for them in getting started. So would you talk a little bit about how could they use a live event for a new or relatively new business? Yes. And I had someone ask that question on another uh, interview I did a, a couple, uh, like a month or so back. And she said she was in a particular uh, industry and she wanted to do an event. What should she do? And it always goes back to the why. Right. So that's where the strategy comes into play is we have more of a that's why the name of my business also has the word consulting is we we have we take that time to talk about what is your business about and what do you plan to do to serve your industry. So if you're someone new and you're listening to this and you're like, I believe having a live event is going to help me launch my business or service or a product. How should I do it? Take a few steps back and think about the why and the why specifically being how can you set yourself apart from everyone else in your industry? How are you going to serve your industry in a way that no one else can? And then you plan your event around that particular circle, if you will, of how, what is my USP? What is my unique selling proposition within my industry so that people are going to want to say, yes, I'm coming to that. And then you outline your content based on that particular circle, if you will, of what your unique selling proposition is within your industry and focus on that. And then really hone in on the experience of what people are going to experience there. And then it ties into what I was saying earlier of using events to build your business and your brand. And I'd like to take a second to talk about what I mean by brand, if that's okay. Sure. So brand isn't necessarily the graphic work, the artwork, what your logo and everything looks like. The brand, and this is extra, the reason I bring this up, Meredith, because it's very important to those that are just starting out. Brand is who you are. Brand is who you are as a business and who you are as the owner of that business and what you want to be known for, your character, what you deliver, how people rely on you, how you are of a service to your community, what you're really known for. An example of that is in my industry as a strategic event planner, 
I'm known for the event planner who is calm, cool, and collected, and that can handle your event with no problem. Um, I remember back in the day, GK Siege and Palmer, you know him, he came up to me always and said, you're like a duck in water, aren't you? And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, you're on the surface, you're fine and cool and collective, but underneath your little feet are just going like crazy to the next thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much me. And I've had speakers over the years, celebrities tell me I've never worked with a planner who has been able to calmly work with me and not be frantic and crazy and like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, how am I going to handle this? And the same thing with the hotels. They're like, I've never worked with a planner who includes me in as part of the team and shares with me all the information. So that's my brand. That's what I'm known for. So as you're preparing to do your first event, to launch your business or your service, Think back again, the why, what do you, what do you want to be known for? What do you want that outcome to be? And make that part of what you do to launch your first event. And lastly, it doesn't have to be big, especially right now, events can't be big, but don't think that just because you only have 20 or 30 people in the room, that it's not going to be successful. It can be very, very successful with minimal people in the room. That is such a great point because I think we can get hung up on the numbers. Exactly. And thinking and, and seeing that as the measure of success. And I think that, you know, that carries over to another area I want to talk about because of where we are right now with the um, pandemic and the restrictions that we've had on traveling, on gathering in groups. So many people are looking to online events. What are some things that you might suggest, recommend, lessons learned from clients you're working with who are taking their in-person events to an online platform? You have to definitely look at it in a different way. So live events, um, are different in so many different ways than virtual events are mean and, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad like there are a lot of good things that a virtual event can bring to the table that a live event necessarily wouldn't have ca captured that number one being that you can capture more of an audience than you never would have before because more people are going to be able to attend a virtual event than they would have in a live event uh, capacity. You can reach a larger audience, meaning internationally, mm -hmm. than you wouldn't have thought of reaching before. You can tip your toes in the water of another part of your industry without it costing you a whole heck of a lot of money to invest than you would have in a live event versus a virtual. So there's that's just three of the extremely positive things that a virtual event can bring to the table that a live event would take a long time to reach with a lot of investment as well to be able to reach it. So, so that's one. Um, the other thing that people need to realize, and it's something that I've been telling people for a while now, Meredith, is you just like a live event, you don't have to put a lot of energy, effort, and money investment into doing your first virtual event. You can use very simple platforms to do your first one just to see how it goes. With one of my clients where we just did our three-day virtual event a couple of weeks ago, we tested the waters with two one-day virtual events, one in April and one in the early part of May, before our actual virtual event happened. And we did it to test all the different things that we wanted to happen during the actual event itself. While we did that, we played around with who was going to be controlling the questions, who was going to be the actual host. How were we going to interact with the people attending? How we were going to do breakout sessions? And during this time, we saw the positives that were coming out of it. And at the end, we did a survey, so don't forget surveys, to find out what the attendees were doing on their end and what kind of feedback, feedback they had so that we can apply it to the next one and then continue to learn. So again, just like a live event, it, the numbers don't really matter as long as you do it. So like Bill always used to say, good is good enough. So, you know, use the most simplest platform virtually that you can, try it out, pick one area of content that you're strong in, that people wanna hear about and that you're known for, and send out an invitation and say, hey, I'm gonna have a two, three hour virtual event. I would love for you to, to attend and see how it goes. 
That's great. For, uh, let's just say someone wanting to do a two-day event or a three-day event, like you just described with one of your clients, when it's virtual, how do you structure the day? Is it three, you know, nine to five kinds of days with breaks built in, or what do you recommend as a structure? It's going to go back again to knowing your audience and what is going to work for them. Now, again, I said in the beginning that you can reach a different audience. You can reach a larger audience. So you're never going to satisfy everyone um, because there are so many different time zones. And if you're reaching internationally, there's so many different other time zones involved in that. I mean, it could be a different day totally for someone else attending. So the, the average poll that I've been seeing, because I've been doing a lot of research on this myself, because I, uh, I don't claim to be a virtual event expert. I'm learning just like everyone else is learning to see what fits and what works because every client's needs are different. So just because someone does it one way, so those of you listening to this right now, just because someone does it one way doesn't mean that's necessarily going to work for you. So what my client did is we're, we kept it as what the time zone was going to be if they attend it virtually, I mean live. So the event was supposed to be in Pacific time zone. So we kept the time to be the same time zone so that even though they might be attending the virtual event eastern they were going to be attending it pacific time zone anyway if they came to it live mm -hmm. so we chose it based on that so if you're the host base it on where you're you were going to have it or where you are currently so that it doesn't confuse you yourself as the host mm -hmm. also keep in mind that the average what i'm hearing is some people try to keep the virtual day to be four hours or less. Are you going to be able to keep all of that that you want to get done in four hours? Probably not. If you want to have it a little bit longer, just make sure you have breaks in. So we started it with about a half hour of open door before the event physic actually started with the presenter. We had a half hour of a host, a virtual host on there interacting with the attendees as they were coming on doing that networking and engagement, getting them ready, kind of going over a little bit of housekeeping, allowing our behind the scenes staff to rename people as they were coming in because we were preparing them for breakout rooms and we needed to have them named properly as they were coming in. And then we would go on just like a regular live event. We would have a presenter speak for about 90 minutes, maximum two hours at some point if it was a lot of content and breakouts happening. Then we would go on a 10 minute break. So you need to give yourself, give them at least a 10 minute break virtually so that they can step away from their computer, go to the bathroom, check on their family, check on a phone call, grab a drink, grab a cup of coffee, and then come back just like they would in a live event. So you want to make sure that you build breaks in. Otherwise, they're going to leave anyway. And that's another point. Virtual events, you're going to lose their attention a lot faster then you would lose their attention live. So make sure that you are engaging with them throughout the event. And that goes back to the type of platform. Uh, there are so many different platforms that you can choose from for your virtual event. Right now, I've been a fan of Zoom because Zoom seems to work very well with the engagement process by doing the chat. You could do a webinar with Q&A. In a regular Zoom room, you can do breakout rooms and you can watch the chat. You just have to have people on your end logistically mm -hmm. to monitor that for you right. and to do the engagement. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. But if you feel like that brings up another question in regards to it, I'll be happy to answer it. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I was curious if um, someone wants to do an event virtually, if they could have recordings that they've done in advance with, mm -hmm. say, they they were going to be bringing on some additional speakers. Does it work out all right for them to have pre-recorded some things that then they simply play during that portion of the event when that person would have been the live speaker? Does that make any difference in terms of engagement, participation, if, if something's pre-recorded versus presented you know, live on this virtual summit? Yes. It does. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because that is something that not a lot of people ask about. So thank you for bringing, because it's super important. In the event I just did with my client, 
what we chose to do, we had uh, contestants who were going to be presenting. And we had decided for the purpose of timing to have them pre-record their session so that we could keep them capped at the time that they needed to make their presentation by so that it allowed us for each of the contestants the same amount of time for Q&A and breakout sessions to have that interaction and engagement. The pre-recorded worked perfectly for that because it allowed them and us to stay on time. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a presenter who physically can't be there for whatever reason live on the virtual event, or it's someone who has a lot of content and you wanna make sure they get it within that amount of time frame, then yes, pre-recording works perfectly for it. But keep in mind, you still have to have a live virtual, I know it's kind of a weird way to say it, engagement around it. Because if you just play a recording, it's just another webinar. If you don't have you know, any engagement at that. Now, I wanna kind of clarify that a little bit. If you say to me, well, Sherry, my speaker can't be with me live. That's why they're pre-recording it. How do I offer the engagement? Well, you do the engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So beforehand with the client and the, the speaker, they kind of talk about the presentation and have a couple of questions lined up that you know your audience is going to ask and get those answers from the speaker so that you can kind of prepare that answer. Mm -hmm. And then when the presentation's over, you open up your platform to a live Q&A with your virtual audience so that the engagement is there and you don't lose it. And then throughout the recording, make sure that your presenter is letting people know, stay tuned, don't hop off, because at the end of this, we're gonna open it up for Q&A. Because what's gonna happen again, virtually people are going to leave. And mm -hmm. if they see it's a recording and not live, they may say, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'll come back to it later. But if you let them know throughout that there's gonna be engagement afterwards, they most likely won't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. What you're bringing up is this idea of uh, really managing expectations uh, yes. of the participants so they know what's coming and what's going to be happening. And I think the kind of the big takeaway from what you're talking about on both kinds of events, in person and virtual, is being creative about how can you uh, you know, uh, engage people, keep them excited, keep the buzz going mm -hmm. during the event and then even afterwards, because you want to have the same kind of, I would think, strategic plan in mind, whether it's in person or virtual, the things you talked about early on. There might be fewer logistics in terms of hotel space and that sort of thing, but there are still a lot of logistics to Absolutely. manage and, and think through up front when you're putting something together online way before you ever launch it. Absolutely. Uh, and, and having someone to think about that on your team for you is so key to this. Um, you know, a lot of people will do a, a live event without hiring a professional planner to help them do it because they believe that they have the skills and the staff to handle it. And, and everything may go okay. And virtually, it may go okay too. But it all comes to the experience. You know, you and I talked about this before we started, that experience is super important. And experience, whether it's bad or it's good, will solely rely on how successful your event is. So, you know, logistically in thinking about, oh, I didn't even think about that, that I've got to worry about that. Oh, I've got to plan for this comes into play with the experience because overall that's what you want the most. You want the best absolute experience as possible. Well, and as we're coming to the end of our time, what I'd love to do is ask you to give, say a couple of tips around two things. One, how, what are some key things that you think would help someone fill their events? So that's question number one, okay. get more people you know, they used to call it butts and seats, <laughs> whether that's online or in person or virtual. And then second, how can they, what are some of the elements to help them create a wildly successful experience for their attendees? So let's go to that first one first is getting people there. What have you seen to be some effective um, strategies for that? Uh, the effective strategies that I've seen work is making it known 
what is going to happen at the event. You know, letting them know what the content is going to be, letting them know who the presenters are going to be, and the fact that they don't want to miss this. Now, I know in the olden days of GKIC, they, they would let them know most of what was happening, but they wouldn't really present the agenda to them. They wouldn't let them know what, the time, what was happening at the time of day or what have you. And if they had a special presenter, like a keynote or a celebrity, they, most of the time they would call him Mr. X. And that is all well and good if you want to kind of keep some of that close at hand, but they're not going to come if they don't know what they're coming to. Mm -hmm. So to fill your event, you need to make sure that you let them know what the content is going to be about. And the strategy behind that, Meredith, that a lot of people miss is you need to pepper it, salt and pepper it throughout your marketing. Don't let them know everything all up, uh, mm -hmm. all at once, mm -hmm. right? You know, continually let them know. And then the other part of it too is once you fill the seats with the person that says yes, you need what I like to call a stick campaign to keep them mm -hmm. there. You know, um, what Bill used to do in the olden days is the coaching members that were part of his coaching program, they would get so upset because they already said, yes, I'm coming, but they'd stop getting the marketing. And Bill and Dan's marketing pieces were so amazing. They wanted to see it so they can S and D. Ah. So we, we found all of that out and we realized, okay, that's great. So Bill created a special piece that they would get all of the marketing pieces at the next mastermind meeting. And then we would go through and explain to them why he did it that way and such. So it kind of opened up to another piece of great value that he was able to deliver. But it also made me think as an event planner, what is super important? You need to continue that engagement. Mm -hmm. So as you're filling seats, let them know what's happening periodically throughout the different marketing. Do not rely on one form of media. Social media is not the only way to market. Email marketing is not the only way to market. Direct response is not the only way to market. Those are just three of many different ways that you can market your event. And you need to test, keep track of, and use as many as you can that will get the attention of the list to say yes mm -hmm. and continually market them throughout. Um, and then the stick campaign to keep them in. And in that stick campaign, you want to kind of let them know a little bit of what they may have missed in the marketing because they already said yes. So, hey, I want to let you know something else that we're working on. If you haven't booked your hotel room yet or, you bought, or bought your airline tickets, now's the time to do so. Registration is going to be this point in time. So communication is very, very, very key. Mm -hmm. um, butts and seats. To me, I want to go back for a minute and talk about quantity versus quality, mm -hmm. right? It is super, super important, and I teach this in my strategy with consulting, is it's super important to have the quality butts and seats than quantity. Mm. You don't want the wrong people in your seats. It's going to cause way too many particular issues that you could have avoided if you didn't have them there to begin with. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, don't give away tickets just to get butts and seats, unless it's to people that you know are quality right? Because there are some people that are trying desperately to start out, but they don't have the money to pay a few hundred or a thousand dollars for a ticket. And you can use them as a scholarship. But don't just give away tickets to get butts and seats because you don't know what that person is like if you don't know that person. Mm -hmm. And if you have a low quality person in the audience and you're trying to sell a high ticket item from stage and they're sitting next to someone who's on the fence, what do you, who do you think is going to win that person over? You? Or the unqualified person sitting next to them saying, are you kidding me? What is this person trying to sell here? So think about that, right? And then going on to the elements of a great experience, mm -hmm. right? It's what do your people want most from you? What do your people want most from you and the interaction? And right now, a lot of people are desperately seeking networking and engagement because they have been stuck behind doors in quarantine for weeks, months, and it's, they're just, they're, they're seeking that engagement. Mm -hmm. and make sure that whether or not you're planning a virtual event or a live event coming up, that your experience allows that opportunity for them to engage. Now I know Sherry, social distancing, all of that we've got to be concerned with. Yes, respect that. 
watch out for that, look for recommendations on how to do that, but the experience should be some sort of engagement with the attendees that are there and with the speakers that are there and with you as the host. The experience has to be more than just you on stage. That's what bottom line. Yeah, that is such an important point because I think, especially people like me that always, you know, whatever we're doing, we want to deliver value. We want to, um, and I can remember Bill talking about this, you know, you can overwhelm people. Don't get hung up on delivering so much content right. that they're over, they're feeling overwhelmed. And now you're starting to deal with negative thoughts and emotions rather than the response you're really looking for. So the, I, I think a really good principle that I'm kind of drawing from what you're saying is really put yourself in the shoes yes. of your potential ideal attendee and yes. think about what they are looking to take away with them mm -hmm. when, after they attend your in-person or virtual event. What do you want them to say? How do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do as a follow-up to what you have provided to them? Absolutely, absolutely. And it could be something as simple as you take day one or the first part of the day, if your event's only one day or if it's two days, giving them the content and the information they need. And then the engagement could be, how do I take what you just taught me and implement it when I leave mm -hmm. here? And then you walk them through that process, right? So it's like going back to what you said, Meredith, is what do you want them to be able to achieve when they leave here? And experience is that umbrella of all of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, Sherry, this has been so great. I know we could keep going. Yes, um, we could. <laughs> but, but I was um, just wanting to ask you to let people know where can they find you online and then where can they connect with you and learn more about the service you offer because it what you're doing is so important for anyone who wants to be really successful in doing any kind of event thank you yes there's two places they can go um, the first place of course is my website which is sls.eventplanning.com, and there you can download my free report on seven big uh, mistakes people make when they plan their own event when it co when it costs them money so it kind of helps you walk through finding ways to bring the most profit out of your events uh, we can set up a 30 minute uh, discovery no charge call to talk about what's on your mind and what you're planning on doing with your event and you could go there and see all kinds of uh, the different services I have to offer private table access to me every month or uh, consulting or even helping you plan and strategize where you want to see your business go and your brand building go in regards to live or virtual events. And then I also have a YouTube channel um, that every week I'm consistently uploading content. There's tons of content that on there now on the build, basic building blocks of putting an event together and the different logistic things you need to think about as well as tons of interviews with lots of different experts in the business and event industry on your mindset and how to build your business, how to build your brand, what to prepare for when it comes to your events, uh, as well as weekly vlogs that I do for myself of, oh, I just, I just came across this. This is what I want to share with you. That's great, Sherry. You're, you're such a wealth of knowledge, experience, wisdom, because of all the things you were exposed to yourself, as you mentioned at the beginning but also things you've been doing since then on your own with clients and the, the cumulative learnings that you've had from all of those events that you've put on. Thank you so much for being with me and with my uh, listeners today and audience. And I just so appreciate you and the work you're doing. And I know we didn't talk about it, but just the light you shine because mm -hmm. of your, your wonderful spirit and the way you give to others, you know, that motivation you have to make a positive difference. I just love that about you too. So thank, thank you. you for being with me today. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, 
Grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.